Papa John's is one of the weirdest modern companies. For a business that's about making and selling pizza, the brand has gone through an alarming amount of nonstop drama, infighting, and controversy in recent years. While every company has its dirty laundry, Papa John's takes the cake with the founder trashing his own company in public. Founders, with their mythical personas and sizable ownership, get more lives than most people in corporate America. As we've seen in the GoPro and Under Armour episodes, you can mess up in spectacular ways as a founder without any real consequences. Every founder puts themselves as the face of their company, and Papa John's took this to the next level, with founder John Schnatter showing up on pizza boxes, brochures, pamphlets, and just about every commercial and public event. It wasn't just his face, but his unfiltered personality that was on full display, which many found to be goofy and odd, but ultimately entertaining and endearing. John Schnatter was Papa John's, and Papa John's was John Schnatter. The same way that companies appoint the same executives, no company fires their CEO or founder unless it's absolutely necessary. But when your founder says the N-word in a recorded business meeting during the era of BLM and DEI, it's an offense so grave that no company could sweep under the rug. This incident single-handedly pushed the narrative that John Schnatter was not this goofy, passionate, yet harmless pizza champion as he had portrayed himself to be, but rather a toxic, out-of-touch, racist CEO. As the official mascot, spokesman, face, and leader of Papa John's, John had made comparably contentious comments in the past, like when he railed against public health care in the United States, equated SEC regulation to the oppression of 19th century Germany, and blamed the NFL player protests as the cause of bad pizza sales. To many, John's repeated offenses were inexcusable and represented exactly why Papa John's as a business has never been able to catch up to Domino's and Pizza Hut. John's problematic behavior was highlighted again weeks after the N-word incident with new allegations of sexual harassment, employee surveillance, misogyny, and extramarital affairs. Companies rarely, if ever, go to war against their own founders. But the timing, evidence, and volume of media covering John's misconduct was so sudden, so strong, and so overwhelming that it was no coincidence. The board wanted to bury John as deep and quickly as possible. These strategically planted leaks continued to paint the narrative of John Schnatter as a leader with more than just poor judgment, outdated thinking, and bad word choice. The message was consistent. It would not be enough to simply exile the founder and former CEO. John was an evil spirit that needed to be cast out, and what Papa John's needed was an exorcism. Under overwhelming public pressure, John was forced out of Papa John's entirely and disappeared overnight from the company's marketing, websites, and packaging. The board went so far as to even adopt a poison pill that would prevent John from ever regaining control over his company. Since his removal in 2018, John has climbed out of the dirt and gone on a high-profile, mudslinging counteroffensive rarely seen in the usually tight-lipped corporate America. Um, I've probably had over 40 pizzas, 40, in the last 30 days. It's, they don't make the pizza the way that I used to make it, the way we used to make it. It just doesn't taste the same. Yeah. The one thing he and I agree on is that Steve Rich is not a CEO. We, that's one thing we do agree on. Um, Rob Lynch, um, he's never been a CEO. He has no pizza experience. He's never been in the pizza category. He doesn't really have a passion for quality. And probably most important, he doesn't have a passion for people. And this, it's not the pizza business, it's the people business. Steve Ritchie, Olivia Curtley, the board of directors, all used the black community and race as a way to steal the company. And they stole the company and now they've destroyed the company. You know, Olivia Curtley and Mark Shapiro should be in jail. And they've hurt a lot of people. And they've hurt people that really count. They've hurt people that wake up every day and make this company great. There's no reason to be in the car when the car crashes, even if you love the car. Stay tuned. The day of reckoning will come, the record will be straight, and everything will be cool again. Why not set the record straight down? I mean, what is it about the record that's not straight? <laughs> Stay tuned. More importantly, John has claimed that he was set up by his COO and once best friend Steve Ritchie. As the controversies and memes have faded away, the real questions have still never been answered. Was John Schnatter actually a good CEO, or was he an egotistical founder holding his own company back? How could a pizza company have so much drama? And was John really the victim of a scheme concocted by his former best friend? What were the strategies before and after John, and how is Papa John's as a company doing now without him? In this episode, we'll cover the exorcism of Papa John's and the unbelievable company drama in its six regimes.
Every modern MBA episode that you watch is hundreds of hours of research, analysis, scripting, animation, and editing. We've only gotten busier and regularly work into the night or skip lunch or dinner to hit deadlines as we no longer have that time to cook and clean. Takeout and delivery is also now super expensive, and that's where Factor has been awesome for me and the modern MBA team. Factor is a leading subscription-based meal delivery service that provides delicious, dietitian-designed meals and this episode's sponsor. Factor delivers restaurant-quality, nutritious meals to your door that you can enjoy with no mess, prep, or fuss. Tonight for dinner, I'm having sun-dried tomato chicken with zucchini noodles for a total of 590 calories, which fits my macros perfectly. I can see the nutrition and ingredients right on the sleeve, assemble it on a plate, or reheat it in the same container, pop it in the microwave, and then enjoy. The chicken breast was moist, seared beautifully, which pairs great with a delicious, creamy, sun-dried tomato sauce that has hints of olive oil and parmesan. And the side of zucchini noodles are tender, fresh, and help cut through the richness of the cream sauce. The knife work and the ingredient selection for all the factor meals we've had so far have been world class. There's so much attention to detail. The green beans come garnished generously with sliced almonds. The broccoli is always young, not wilted, and comes with compound truffle butter. You get these ripe cherry tomatoes that burst into the sauce, and even generous hearty beef that's marinated in a tangy, homemade, sharp, spicy Mexican cheese sauce. Factor also offers some really amazing cold pressed juices like pineapple turmeric basil, carrot orange ginger, and apple kale wheatgrass. Of all the Factor meals that we've had, I've genuinely enjoyed all of them. If you blindfolded me and told me that any of our Factor meals were really a $20 to $30 entree from a local restaurant, I would 100% believe you. Factor has saved me so many trips to the grocery store and on prepping, cooking, and cleaning, which means more time to create great content. With over 34 different weekly meals to choose from, I can easily find meals that fit my current health and wellness goals. Since I'm in a cutting phase, I can opt for more of their cleaner, leaner, protein plus meals that have 30 grams or more of protein per serving. If you're busy, you don't have time to cook, and you're tired of wasting money on the same lukewarm crappy takeout or getting ripped off by overpriced delivery fees from restaurants, try Factor today. It's super convenient and everything is always hot, fresh, and ready in just two minutes. All you have to do is heat and enjoy and get back to work or life. Factor is also super flexible, so you can always adjust your order more or less in the weeks as you need any time. Go to factor75.com or click the link below and use the code MODERNMBA50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. Visit factored75.com and use the code MODERNMBA50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. Thank you to Factor for supporting Modern MBA and making this episode possible. Pizza is popular everywhere. The universal appeal, simple preparation, and low skill requirements have made pizzas a booming billion dollar business in every region of the world. Like fried chicken or the beverage chains that we've covered in the past, pizza shops are space efficient businesses that do most of their business through takeout or delivery. Compared to fast food chains, pizzerias are smaller in size and often run by fewer employees. While the biggest food cost for restaurants is protein, the most expensive ingredient for pizzerias is the cheese. While every commodity goes through its ups and downs, cheese remains a much cheaper commodity compared to beef or poultry. However, the low barriers to entry and the high margins have made the pizza business extremely competitive and saturated. Independent pizzerias generally outperform on quality and unit economics as they have the means to create better pizzas and charge higher prices. Pizza chains went on value and cost through economies of scale. With thousands of locations worldwide, these chains can source millions of pounds of cheese and other ingredients in bulk at the lowest possible cost. Like burger chains, pizza chains like Domino's or Papa John's achieve this grand scale through franchising. As a result, they outperform the independence on value, reach, and volume by serving lesser quality products but in larger quantities and at radically lower prices. In the United States, independent pizzerias still outnumber the chains. However, the chains enjoy higher earnings on average and on a per store basis. But it's not all smooth sailing, as competing on value means a race to zero on who can offer the most pies at the lowest price. The competition is even more intense at the very bottom of the market with frozen pizza, where brands like DiGiorno's and Red Baron are constantly improving their own products in order to match the chains. What is slightly unique to the pizza chain business is that supplying the raw dough, cheese, pepperoni, tomato sauce, and packaging is a revenue stream that is just as lucrative as selling the finished hot product. For every pie to taste the same, franchisees must use the ingredients supplied by their parent company. 
This is a standard practice in franchising, as mandating the same ingredients and equipment is the only way to guarantee that food served in one place will taste the same in another. But most franchise-based businesses generally do not mark up the cost of supplies, and franchisees typically buy directly from designated independent suppliers at pre-negotiated rates. For instance, Denny's, McDonald's, and Popeye's negotiate with outside suppliers to get the best rate for all their franchisees. They don't mark up the price from retailers, and they handle their supply chain through separate, not-for-profit, member-owner co-ops. This way, franchisees don't feel like they're being taken advantage of, and everyone is aligned on the singular goal of driving food and drink sales. Pizza chains are different because of their vertical integration. They run every aspect of the supply chain themselves in that they assemble, age and portion out the dough, they make their own cheese blends that are shredded to a specific size and shape, and they make their own proprietary sauces. When pizza franchisees get their dough, cheese, sauce, and toppings, they're not paying outside suppliers at cost. Instead, they pay a premium to their parent company for these required supplies as Domino's and Papa John's at a 5-10% to markup for these supplies. If we look at both of these companies, their supply chains are for-profit revenue streams that earn them almost as much as pizza sales and even more than franchise royalties. Domino's, Pizza Hut, and Papa John's are the three largest pizza chains in the world, but Papa John's has always been a distant third. From the 90s to the early 2000s, Papa John's was led by none other than its founder, John Schnatter. In this first regime, the chain focused most on cementing Papa John's as a fast-growing and worthy entrant into the big three of pizza delivery. From a revenue and scale standpoint, the company was far behind its rivals. And with lighter pockets, John marketed Papa John's in this era as a personable, old-school, authentic neighborhood pizzeria to differentiate from the faceless, soulless corporations of Domino's and Pizza Hut. John placed himself in every advertisement as the mascot, champion, and living embodiment of Papa John's. Yet no matter how strong your message is, awareness is still a function of spend, and Papa John's did not have the capital to compete when it came to ad spend. But the message that John came up with was effective. While Pizza Hut and Domino's are giving you the same cheap, processed crap, Papa John's is taking a stand and putting quality first in an era where no one else is holding the line. Papa John's dough was fresh, never frozen, the cheese was 100% real mozzarella, the sauce was made from vine-ripened tomatoes and not concentrate, the meat had zero artificial fillers, and fresh local onions, bell peppers, and portobello mushrooms were sliced daily at each restaurant. Each pizza came by default with garlic sauce and pepperoncinis. Papa John's justified charging a few dollars more for its pizzas through this premium positioning. John's steady vision took the chain into areas that his rivals didn't dare to as he spent $8 million in 2001 to be the first pizza chain to accept online orders. The volume of pizzas sold at Papa John's around the world grew nearly 200% in 8 years from $619 million in 1996 to $1.82 billion by the time of his departure in 2004. In 8 years, Papa John's had scaled from 1,100 locations in 1996 to well over 2,800 locations by 2004. Rapid expansion like this is only possible through franchising, so John naturally sweetened the deal to lure in franchisees. Any operator who was looking to open up 10 or more stores could borrow money from Papa John's directly to build these restaurants with only 20% down. These loans were collateralized on the restaurants themselves, meaning in a default, Papa John's could take over construction and finish the stores without any delays. The number of franchise Papa John's grew three times from 800 to over 2,000, while the number of company-owned and operated Papa John's restaurants went from 300 to 569 in the same period. With more stores, the company naturally began to take more of a franchiser role, reducing company locations down to 20%. Whenever the dial is turned towards franchising, you can see those changes immediately reflected in the operating margin, and Papa John's was no different. While franchise royalties grew three times from $18 million to $50 million, pizza sales at company restaurants and selling supplies to franchisees both became far more valuable revenue streams, bringing in nearly eight times the amount of cash every year. When companies are growing, they need cash flow more than an investor brownie points. While John had no shortage of swagger at home, he was a lot less confident about how Papa John's would hold up overseas. The UK was the primary target of John's international plans due to the strong cultural overlap between the Americans and the English. In order to accelerate expansion in the UK, John bought out the England-based pizza chain Perfect Pizza for $32 million with the goal of converting their locations in place into Papa John's, which in theory was less risky than building from scratch. But breakneck expansion had permanently altered the power dynamics at home. 
Papa John's franchisees in the US, who were now carrying the business and the royalties that they paid and the supplies that they bought, now had the authority to demand change. Even though Papa John sold nearly $2 billion of pizza every year, the company was regressing at home. As John spent more time overseas attempting to kickstart the international business, the domestic business declined as US-based franchisees grossed less year after year. As franchisee relationships turned hostile, the board took the reins away from John and into the hands of a more seasoned leader. In 2005, Papa John's appointed their newest CEO in Nigel Travis, the former CEO of Blockbuster who had scaled the once invincible video rental store. Nigel was an Englishman who the board believed could unlock the growth in the UK and in Europe that John as an American had been unable to. Just three years after Nigel's appointment, Blockbuster was knocking on death's door, but as in life and in the corporate world, timing is everything. Blockbuster was at its peak in 2004, and the poaching of Nigel at the time was widely regarded as a major win for Papa John's. John was given a graceful exit and stayed close as chairman. In the press release, the board made clear the reason for this regime change with the inclusion of a seemingly innocuous yet pointed sentence about franchisee relations. Nigel would usher in a second regime at Papa John's, but his reign was cut to just three short years as John would eventually ruthlessly overthrow Nigel to reclaim his seat on the throne. The easiest way to resuscitate sales would have been to lower prices at Papa John's to match Pizza Hut and Domino's, but such a tactic was not possible. John had built his company as a premium chain, and as chairman, he would not let anyone mess with his core positioning. As a result, Nigel had to come up with workarounds that would improve the bang for buck appeal for consumers without outright discounting the core pizza product. Nigel leaned on promotional pricing where customers could still get discounts with Papa John's, but only for a limited time or under very specific conditions. Between 2005 and 2008, Papa John's partnered with Netflix, Sony, and Blockbuster, where customers would get coupons off in exchange for DVD purchases. Under Nigel, Papa John's also launched items like the Chocolate Pastry Delight, the Cine Swirl Treats, the Apple Twist, and the Cinnamon Sticks. And customers would still pay full price for a pizza at Papa John's, but these sides and desserts were regularly discounted or packaged into deals so customers would get more mileage out of their dollar. Nigel also strengthened the pizza product to convince customers that the extra $2 to $4 that they were paying for Papa John's was still money well spent by adding specialty pizzas like the Tuscan Six Cheese and the Italian Meat Trio. Caught between the Great Recession, the growing consumer demand for value, and Papa John's higher prices, Nigel had one hand behind his back. The pizza segment is under pressure, the economy is under pressure, and hence our franchisees are under pressure. While we are confident that value is not just a low quality pizza at a cheaper price, we also understand that there is a danger in overpricing our product to the point that consumers are incentivized to trade down to an inferior product. We continue to believe that we have more latitude than our competitors due to the quality positioning of our brand, but that latitude certainly has its limits. Nigel targeted non-traditional venues to capture every possible sale, partnering with Six Flags and Live Nation to sell pizza at amusement parks, concerts, and stadiums. Nigel had no interest in following the footsteps of KFC, Domino's, or even McDonald's, where franchises make up 90-99% to of all locations and the business just becomes about collecting royalties. Nigel reversed the progress that John had previously made, as he believed in maintaining 15-20% to of all Papa John's restaurants as corporate locations. His tactic was straight out of the blockbuster playbook, where the company could leverage its corporate personnel like a hospital ICU. Papa John's identified underperforming locations, bought out the struggling franchisees, put in its own management who would then rehabilitate these troubled assets through training and renovation. Once these stores stabilized, Papa John's would then flip them at a premium to new franchisees or just simply permanently add them to its corporate roster. The number of company-operated locations increased under Nigel as he used this buy versus build tactic to fortify Papa John's in underperforming markets like Philadelphia, Phoenix, and the West Coast. Nigel's greatest success was in his globetrotting prowess. While the losses continued for the international division, he grew Papa John's overseas to heights that John could not achieve previously. Papa John's went from 267 international locations at the time of John's exit to 565 stores by the time of Nigel's departure. The company opened up its first ever stores in Poland, Turkey, and Russia, grew to over 100 stores in the UK, and doubled its presence in China. Nigel scrapped John's perfect pizza venture and dumped the UK brand just one year in for an eight-figure loss. 
These collective improvements snapped Papa John's out of its funk, and the company's revenue broke the billion dollar mark for the first time. Relations with franchisees were also restored, as the average Papa John's US franchise made more money under Nigel now than they ever had under John. It's worth noting that while Papa John's revenue was stronger under Nigel, his tactics did come with a trade-off where he gave up margin in exchange for cash flow. Yet Nigel always publicly stood behind John. Quote, it will be easy for us to reduce the quality of our pizzas by reducing the amount and quality of our toppings and crusts, but our customers have continuously told us that they come to Papa John's for the best quality products in the industry. John founded a great company and a great concept, and I've tried very hard not to deviate from his heritage. Any changes I make to Papa John's as CEO is changing the past, and there is an implied criticism there. I have to be sensitive to that. The majority of the time, John and I have a good relationship, and from time to time there are differences. We're both passionate and we have very strong personalities. So we both argue when we have to, pretty furiously, but there's nothing wrong with that. My wife is passionate and I argue with her from time to time too. But behind the scenes, John was plotting his revenge. In his own book, John writes that Nigel was a selfish, money-driven, uncollaborative usurper who was squeezing short-term profits at the expense of long-term growth. John was particularly bothered by the chain's new desserts under Nigel, which he saw as cheap, tacky, childish candy foods that took away from the pizza. In mid-2008, John went to the board with a 20-page presentation demanding Travis's removal. In the three years that Nigel was busy growing the company, John had been smooth-talking board members and secretly converting his sympathizers into allies who would eventually support his claim to the throne. John's presentation at this point was nothing but a formality. Nigel was pushed out in December of 2008 and eventually landed at Dunkin' Donuts where he found his fairy tale ending there. Nigel's seven-year run as Dunkin's CEO concluded gracefully in the form of retirement and a lucrative payout, the latter of which he promptly spent buying up his favorite childhood football club. Yet John's accusation of Nigel as a short-term profit squeezer is weird in that the numbers don't match the narrative. Nigel had done the opposite. He had consistently given up profits in exchange for revenue and aggressively subsidized the international business with that cash to scale overseas. In 2009-2011, Papa John's entered its third and latest regime, with John returning to the helm as the interim CEO. But while the board had been convinced that firing Nigel was necessary, they were less convinced of John's ability to lead on his own. They kept John on a short leash by appointing a co-CEO by the name of Jude Thompson. But this leash was made more of clay than chain. As a veteran insurance executive with zero restaurant or hospitality experience, Jude was clearly no threat to John, he had very little to contribute, and he was only there to serve as the board's eyes and ears on the ground. While John had taken a backseat in marketing under Nigel, there was now no one to stop him from taking the spotlight once more. At John's direction, Papa John's rolled out Papa in the House, which featured John personally delivering pizzas to customers and being welcomed into their homes with cheers and applause. These ads were a major success and even went viral, which gave Papa John's greater exposure than ever before and impressed upon the masses this idea of John as this goofy, quirky, harmless family man turned pizza zealot. It was now impossible to disconnect John from Papa John's and vice versa. In his book, John in his own words claims that when he returned as CEO in 2009, he found that Nigel had left Papa John's in quote, a worse place than at any point in our 25 year history. Yet this appears to be false. Nigel had left behind a solid foundation and all John did to sustain that growth was continued expansion and sustained advertising. John sweetened the pot once again by offering no upfront fee and no royalties for 12 months to new franchisees. With these incentives, Papa John's scaled from 3,380 locations worldwide at the time of Nigel's exit in 2008 to 3,883 in 2011. By 2011, the company had achieved eight straight years of positive sales, even through the Great Recession, where its rivals in Domino's and Pizza Hut were nowhere as successful. The rapid expansion had no impact on earnings as the average US Papa John's franchise grossed better sales than ever. That same momentum continued overseas where the international business reached record levels of scale and earnings. At this point, Papa John's made more money selling supplies to franchisees than it did from royalties or pizza sales. Yet in 2011, just one year after serving as co-CEO alongside John, Jude suddenly resigned, stating that he wanted to go back into insurance. It was later leaked that Jude had shown up to multiple company events alongside a woman who wasn't his wife, and was later confirmed to be a high-class escort. 
But this transgression was unrelated to his departure, and Jude's time at Papa John's is a complete mystery. There is not a single shred of interview, photo, or even a public appearance on the internet of Jude Thompson at Papa John's. Regardless, Jude's resignation, the sustained business growth, the ad virality, all helped solidify John as the one true CEO of Papa John's. There would be no challengers, no usurpers, no doubters, and no more detractors to stop John from doing what he wanted. In 2012, Papa John's entered its fourth regime, where John had the freedom to rule over every part of his kingdom as he saw fit. But despite the unsavory undermining behind the scenes and his goofy public personality, John actually demonstrated a deep understanding of the pizza market and its evolution in ways that few people ever could. Under John, Papa John's made meaningful progress along many fronts, and he showed none of the arrogance, complacency, and ignorance that other founder CEOs suffered from, like we covered in the GoPro or Under Armour episodes. Quote, what we've seen in the last two years is a shakeout where you have Little Caesars down at the $5 price point, and then Domino's right above them, and then Pizza Hut, and then Papa John's is above all of them. We continue to believe that's where we're all going to play. You can't set your pricing over a long period of time and not expect it to have an impact whether you're trying to be the premium player or the discount player. Frankly, our competitors are good at what they do. But if you look at it from the 40,000 foot level, Pizza Hut is losing big, Domino's is on fire, and Papa John's is just solid. The consumer recognizes that you get what you pay for, and you just can't make a superior pizza with quality ingredients for 5 6 or $7. It's impossible. What matters most to me personally is our constant efforts to deliver a better quality pizza. This is not some corporate social responsibility campaign or PR stunt. Those of you who know me personally know that when it comes to quality, there is absolutely no compromise ever. A lot of our business is coming from millennials, because like Chipotle, we just use better ingredients and I think the kids can taste the difference. I'm prepared to spend more money than the others because I believe we will be rewarded for our commitment with unprecedented customer loyalty. Between 2012 and 2017, Papa John's made leaps in product and operations. To align with the modern health-conscious consumer, Papa John's became the first pizza chain to remove trans fat, hydrogenated oils, MSG, artificial flavors, synthetic colors, and high fructose corn syrup from its entire food menu. Lower calorie options were introduced, vegetables were now organic, and a gluten-free crust was made available. The menu roared to life with the release of premium products like the buffalo chicken pizza and the double cheeseburger pizza, which all sold for $12 versus Domino's and Pizza Hut's $8.99 and $9.99 prices. John also had learned from his predecessors and inherited their best practices. He resumed Nigel's build versus buy ICU strategy to even greater effect, buying back struggling franchisees and putting in corporate management to revitalize slow markets. The number of corporate-owned stores grew but represented less and less of the fleet as expansion continued, with Papa John surpassing over 5,000 stores in 2016. When it came to marketing, John doubled down on both his face and American sports by committing to multi-year deals with the NFL, the MLB, Peyton Manning, and other high-profile athletes, all of whom also became Papa John franchisees with restaurants of their own. By 2015, Papa John's became the only pizza chain to boast 12 consecutive years of positive sales. Revenue grew by $100 million every year as supply sales to franchisees and royalties surpassed the food and drink sales of Papa John's own corporate restaurants. As John turned the dial towards the pure franchiser play, the operating margins and profits swung away from the single digits under Nigel and towards the low teens. The international division was also finally delivering the goods, delivering the double-digit growth and nine-figure sales that investors had long desired. John openly criticized Nigel for doing too much too quickly, as the lack of focus and breakneck pace of expansion overseas in years prior had resulted in the neglect of product standards. Over the course of multiple years, John revamped Papa John's supply chains overseas to ensure that the cheeses, sauces, and doughs in every international market would taste as close as possible to those used in America. Under John, the company achieved record success in Latin America, Russia, the UK, and the Middle East. But the struggles continued in Asia, where the pizza chain failed to catch on with customers. The constant leadership turmoil on both sides of the equation did not help, and John eventually threw in the towel on China after a decade of losses. Papa John's would remain in China, but its supply chain, commissaries, distribution centers, and company restaurants were all sold off to local operators. The fate and profit upside of Papa John's in China would now rest exclusively in the hands of an external company. Earning only the franchise royalties and missing out on the supply chain sales resulted in a significant downgrade in Papa John's income and cash flow for the entire region. 
The business may have been slowing, but there was no signs that could have predicted the controversies that would unfold in 2017. When John blamed declining NFL viewership as the root cause for Papa John's weak sales, the media pounced and misconstrued his words as a direct attack on social activism and racial equality efforts in the United States. Quote, the NFL has hurt us. More importantly, by not resolving the current debacle to the players' and owners' satisfaction, NFL leadership has hurt Papa John's shareholders. Let me explain. The NFL has been a long and valued partner over the years, but we are certainly disappointed that the NFL and its leadership did not resolve the ongoing situation to the satisfaction of all parties long ago. This should have been nipped in the bud one and a half years ago. Like many sponsors, we are in contact with the NFL. Once the issues are resolved between the players and the owners, we are optimistic that the NFL's best years are ahead, but good or bad, leadership starts at the top. And this is an example of poor leadership. Last year, the ratings for the NFL went backwards because of the elections. This year, the ratings have continued to go backwards because of the controversy. The controversy is polarizing the customer, polarizing the country, and that's the big difference. It seems clear that John was pointing the finger here at the NFL commissioner, Roger Goodell, for the declining viewership of the NFL, and not at the players, the protesters, or even the viewers themselves. If anything, John goes to great lengths to explicitly not take any side. But that didn't stop the media from spinning John's words into a provocative, stereotypical narrative of another privileged, wealthy white male authority figure oppressing an African-American minority. Bad news sells, and there are few things better for clicks and views than manufactured outrage. The mob came for John, and the ham-fisted, hasty apology issued by the company only solidified the narrative and added greater fuel to the fire. In the face of overwhelming negativity, consumer boycotts, never-ending press, canceled sponsorships, and a downward spiraling stock price, John voluntarily stepped down as CEO to take the heat off the company in December of 2017. In his place, he chose his best friend and COO, Steve Ritchie, to take over as CEO. John had mentored, grown, and promoted Steve over 20 years at Papa John's from a lowly delivery driver making $6 an hour to a powerful multi-million dollar executive. Contrary to past successors, John demonstrated his full support for his best friend through enthusiastic praise. Quote, I am so proud of Steve. He's excelled at every job he's ever had at Papa John's, from being an hourly customer service rep to a delivery driver, store general manager, director of operations, franchisee, and most recently president. Steve will put the spotlight on our pizza and the most important ingredient, our team members. We couldn't have a more proven leader to guide Papa John's through its next stage of growth. Yet the leadership structure, with John sitting as chairman and Steve as CEO directly reporting into John, ensured continuity. John would continue running Papa John's through Steve as a proxy. But what John didn't know at the time was that Steve had little interest in being a puppet. And when the opportunity arose to remove John from the equation, Steve capitalized and let the world bury his best friend. From 2018 to 2020, Papa John's would enter its fifth regime, the short-lived reign of Steve Ritchie. The prior decades of marketing had intertwined Papa John's the company and John the individual so deeply that customers could not disassociate the two. The narrative and controversies around John left the company in a sudden downward spiral. Years of revenue growth and brand goodwill had disappeared overnight. Domestic sales regressed as millennials and African Americans bought their pizzas elsewhere. While John had a strong vision and established strategies that he wanted Steve to continue executing on, it was ultimately Steve who was the captain of this now sinking ship. If things went wrong, it would be Steve's head that would roll, and not John's. The once close relationship between these two friends turned hostile as the two started butting heads over marketing and product. In all fairness to Steve, it would be difficult for anyone to still believe in John's advice and strategies. After all, it was John who had gotten the company into this mess, and it was improbable that it would be John who would get them out. Steve's first move was to overhaul advertising in an attempt to break the association between John the individual and Papa John's the brand. His second move was to lower prices. Quote, the research is clear. Customers who prefer Papa John's often go to a competitor because we are perceived to be too expensive. Over the last few years, consumers viewed our quality as simply part of our tagline without a real connection to our products. Much of our marketing has become predictable and lacks differentiation. As part of our efforts to show consumers that quality is more than just a brand slogan at Papa John's, we are building a new marketing approach guided by our new CMO, advertising, and PR agencies to tell the story of why our ingredients make better pizza. But in order to drive sales, Steve had thrown out the baby with the bathwater. 
He undoed decades of Papa John's hard-earned premium positioning by suddenly matching Domino's and Pizza Hut in value deals. Under Steve, Papa John sold pizzas at the lowest prices ever and with the greatest discounts in company history. Lowering pizza prices to turn a buck is a move that John would never have agreed to and not even one that Nigel dared to try during the Great Recession. The price cutting helped stem the bleeding as Papa John's rebounded the following year in 2019. Yet Steve had enough awareness to know that even with improved results, he was still politically vulnerable. He knew that John would be coming for him and based on the past, if you leave John on the sidelines long enough, he will find a way to turn the board against you. Steve needed two things to protect his seat on the throne. One, he had to remove John from the board, and two, he had to put in aggressive, individualistic board members who would keep John out. The first step was to get rid of John. Before John resigned as CEO in 2017, he had picked a new ad agency by the name of Laundry Service to evolve Papa John's advertising. Laundry Service had invited John to a phone conversation to discuss advertisement ideas, but then suddenly changed up the agenda without notice to be about role-playing exercises about race and diversity training. What John didn't know was that the call was being recorded. Time for us to ask you the questions that we think you're going to get and just hear your point of view on it so we can make sure that we're integrating an honest, truthful answer, but also helping avoid any potential issue that could come up. Is that okay? Yeah. Um... The, when did this go out? Because she did the couple of sheets of paper. That's the same paper as an extra copy. Yeah. Oh, when did, when did this go out? So, oh, we just got it. Why, why wouldn't you give this to me pre read for me? I mean, I mean I'll, I'll read it, but I mean, I could be a lot more helpful if I'd already read it coming into the meeting. Because we just did it last night and over the weekend, so we were just getting it together, to be honest with you. So, so do you want to do this exercise now, or do you want to just take the time and jump back on the call once you've had it? Because, because again, this was just completed. No, no, no. You guys go ahead and do do your thing. The most important thing is that we just clear the air and set the record straight. It's it's, it's less important exactly what your point of view is, John. It, it, it's it's just important that people understand and know what it is, because right now their imaginations are running wild and think that you're this right wing extremist neo Nazi racist who doesn't pay his people, and it's obviously untrue, and that's what we just have to clear the air. I think the, I the way the, the world works today, you, the only way to clear the air is to clear the air. And, and so you have a lot that you want to say, and you have a strong point of view, and that's what's not gotten out there, and that's what we want to get out there. We want that, the truth to come out on it. And what we just need to do now is, is make sure we're not too aggressive in, in telling the truth. That's why we're pushing uh, this. That's why we're pushing to do this as soon as possible. That's we, we want to get your. We want to get you out there and, and get the truth out as quickly as we can. So we well, can I mean, that's what I'm going to associate with spirals. Up in New York, we made a decision. We're going to go out and get killed again, and then I don't have to worry about doing that. And I got to tell you, heaven forbid this company if they're not going to use me at all. Uh, when, after I'm looking at this research, I mean, I'm just not seeing how you're not tell the Papa John story. And let them. What bothers me is Colonel Sanders called black. I'm like, I've never used that word. And they get away with it. Yeah, we use the word the bottle and we get framed in the same uh, yeah. same genre. It's crazy. The yeah. whole thing's crazy. Nah, okay. Thank Colorado. you. Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John. All right, I'll see you. Thanks, John. I've got a three o'clock with Charles Cole, and then I'll be over to see Mario and there with Mr. Nance. Okay. I got Michael too. Three. Oh, so. Good. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Thank you. I hope he gets sent out the pastor on this shit. I really, really fuck it. While the use of the N-word is never acceptable in any context, it was also obvious that John did not direct the term at anyone or any group with any ill intent. Yet after the call had ended, the executives at Laundry Service forgot that the recording was still running and made clear how they felt about John. The railroading left a bad taste in John's mouth, and weeks later Papa John's fired Laundry Service due to creative differences, something that Steve had explicitly mentioned himself earlier as CEO. A dispute soon followed between the ad agency and the pizza chain over its payments. Laundry service threatened Steve, as Papa John's latest and newest CEO, that if the pizza chain did not pay up the $6 million that the ad agency believed that it was owed, they would in turn bury John. When Steve chose not to pay up, the ad agency followed through on its threat and promptly leaked an edited recording of the phone call to the press as revenge. 
The media once again ran with the story, and Papa John's now found itself again in hot waters. As the witch hunt arrived at the gates with their torches and pitchforks, Steve chose to step aside and give up John to the angry mob, rather than defending his friend. At Steve's authorization, Papa John's issued an apology for John's use of the N-word, which once again only cemented his guilt in the court of public opinion. Steve sharpened the dagger even further by writing an open letter to the press and the media and customers, distancing Papa John's from its troubled founder. Since these company statements could not be retracted or edited after the fact, these were effectively death sentences and John was forced to resign from the board. You've heard one voice of Papa John's for a long time. It's time you heard from all of us. My name is Samir Merchant, and I'm a franchise owner since 2005. My name is Brant Barnes, and I've been a franchisee for 13 years. I'm Kirsten Bates, the general manager of Papa John's in Southfield, Michigan. When I'm out in the community, I engage people, and they know me as uh, Papa John's guy. When John discovered what Steve had done, he went on the counteroffensive against his former friend. But at that point, it was too late. Steve found an ally in Starboard Value, one of Wall Street's most feared activist investors and accomplished hedge funds. Starboard is known for their political prowess and cunning. In 2014, the hedge fund took over Olive Garden despite owning less than 10% of the company. Through a set of carefully choreographed character assassination pieces, Starboard turned the public against Olive Garden and its management to the point where the company had no choice but to give itself up to Starboard. Steve brought Starboard on to Papa John's with the hopes of having found a long-term political partner, but was too foolish to see that the hedge fund was loyal to no one but the numbers. Under Steve, Papa John's numbers weren't great, his vision was not compelling, and his presence at the company was becoming a greater distraction, as John was constantly attacking him in public for being a bad CEO out of revenge. Starboard rewarded Steve by firing him, enacted a poison pill to keep John out, and appointed Arby's Rob Lynch in 2019 as the latest CEO of Papa John's. Now in present day, Papa John's is in its sixth regime under Rob Lynch. Instead of attempting to match Domino's or Pizza Hut in value, Rob has re-emphasized the chain's legacy premium positioning and instilled a new focus on product innovation to win customers. Papa John's has unleashed creativity into areas of the product that historically had never been allowed under John. Under Rob, the company has rolled out the garlic parmesan crust, the epic stuffed crust, and the crispy parm pizza, which was the first time in company history that any flavor or texture had been added to the base pizza dough. Papa Bites and Papadillas were introduced as flexible entrees that could be flavored in different ways and give customers more options beyond pizza. And the advertising has changed to focus purely on the food versus any one individual or even celebrity. Quote, as a challenger brand, it is imperative that we maximize the value of our media dollars so that they work harder for us as we are outspent five to one by our largest competitor. We believe that by making our food the hero of our communications, we will distance ourselves from our competition. And by moving dollars out of the high cost national sponsorships and into working media, we are able to reach a broader range of consumers more often. Under Rob, Papa John's has soared to new heights in revenue and profits, despite John's insistence that it's all going downhill. The U.S. business has fully recovered as customers are excited by the new products. But despite the growing international business, Papa John's still seems to be a difficult sell overseas. The story of Papa John's is an entertaining and practical case study of what happens when you turn yourself into a brand. For all the undermining and backstabbing that John did in the past several decades, whether he did it out of fiduciary duty as he claims, or out of ego, one might say that where John ended up today is simply the result of karma. It's said that he who seeks revenge should dig two graves. And in the case of John, while he had been busy digging graves to bury Nigel and Stephen, he never thought that he was also digging his own. While John's defamation lawsuit against the ad agency is now moving towards a trial, his inevitable redemption in court will not actually give him what he wants. As long as Starboard remains in control, John will never be CEO of Papa John's again, and will always be an outsider to his own company. This episode is also sponsored by Moomoo, a leading Silicon Valley-based online broker that helps you start your investment journey at a relatively low cost. With Moomoo, you will have access to plenty of free tools that provide comprehensive market data and help you do your research. U.S. users get zero commission trading for U.S. stocks and ETFs. On top of that, Moomoo's new Cash Suite program also offers a 5.1% APY on your uninvested cash for new U.S. users as well, higher than what you'll find with most mainstream brokers. There is no minimum deposit or balance requirements. You can begin with an amount that suits you. There's no cap on the interest you can earn through the program, and interest accrues automatically on uninvested cash. 
You have the flexibility to invest your funds at any time. No manual redemption is necessary and your buying power is calculated based on the swept cash. Your funds are safeguarded by the FDIC with insurance coverage up to $1 million at partner banks. In addition to the 5.1% APY, new users can also enjoy one of the welcome bonuses. New users can receive up to 15 free stocks by opening up an account and depositing funds. Depositing $100 earns you 5 free stocks, while depositing $1,000 entitles you to a total of 15 free stocks. Or, if you transfer eligible assets to Moomoo, you can receive cash rewards of up to $400. For more terms and conditions, sign up via the link down below to check. On Moomoo, all analysis is presented in easy-to-read charts and graphs. Users have access to over 63 technical indicators and 38 drawing tools to easily identify new trends on Moomoo. Investing can be intimidating, but Moomoo has a smart UI interface that shows you important information at your fingertips, where even beginners can trade like pros. This is why Moomoo has empowered over 20 million users worldwide with the ability to conquer the stock market. Check out our link down below for more information about trading fees and new user rewards on Moomoo.